Hello learners, welcome to today's session on metaphor and metonymy conceptualized by Raman Chakotsky. I am Ms. Linda P. Joseph, Assistant Professor from the Department of English, Carmel College, Mala. Let's get started. Roman Jacobson was a Russian-born American linguist and Slavic language scholar. Being a pioneer of Russian formalism, he was associated with the Moscow Linguistic Circle found in 1915 and co-founded Prague Linguistic Circle in 1926. Following his immigration to America in 1941, Jacobson co-founded the Linguistic Circle of New York. His primary concern has always been language in all of its manifestations. He was in fact a pioneer of structural linguistics and worked extensively in poetics, phonology, historical linguistics, morphosyntax, semiotics, psycholinguistics and cultural and literary history. Now, before we look into Jacobson's theory of language as such, let's take a look at how language functions. There are two axes of language, the paradigmatic axis, which is the vertical axis of selection, and the syntagmatic axis, which is the horizontal axis of combination. So you select words and you combine words. These are the basic modes of behavior by which language users like us construct and understand linguistic messages. Now, this principle of selection and combination, it intermingles at every point or level of speech. We may not exactly be aware of it, but this process of selecting words and combining words so as to communicate an appropriate message happens at every level. Now, let's see what is this vertical axis of selection, the paradigmatic axis. This is where a set of linguistic units can be substituted for each other in the same position within a sequence of structure. It doesn't distort or affect the syntax as in the arrangement of words to create well-formed sentences. For example, in the statement the cat was sitting on the rug, I could substitute the article the by selecting any linguistic units from this vertical axis of selection. I could go with a cat was sitting on the rug, the cat was sitting on the rug, his cat was sitting on the rug, or my cat was sitting on the rug. Similarly, on the syntagmatic axis, that is a horizontal axis of combination, we combine linguistic units into a recognizable order. So any sentence is a syntagm of words. For example, the statements given here, I write what I know, I know what I write. These statements contain the same units, I, write, what, and know. However, the meanings of these two sentences are different because the linguistic units are arranged differently based on the syntagmatic system. So on the syntagmatic axis, we could say that words are linked or chained together according to grammatical rules. Whereas the paradigmatic axis is the axis of choice. We can make choices about which words to link together. So to develop his theory of language, Jacobson worked with aphasics, those are people who have speech difficulties, to see how they use and understand ordinary speech. So in his work published in 1956 titled Two Aspects of Language and Two Types of Aphasic Disturbances, he makes a statement saying that speech implies a selection of certain linguistic entities and their combination into linguistic units of higher degree of complicity. Obviously, language functions through this process of selecting words and combining words. So, based on his study, he distinguished two kinds of aphasia or speech difficulties. One is a similarity disorder, the other one is the contiguity disorder. A patient with similarity disorder would find it hard to select and substitute words, but his ability to combine words would be relatively stable. So what is important for such a patient to make a meaningful sentence is the context. The context is an indispensable decisive factor. So this context could mean two things. First, there is this situation, the context of situation, the immediate environment. For example, to construct a sentence like it is raining, the patient should be able to see that it is actually happening. It is raining. Second, there is the verbal context, things that have just been said. As I say, the cat sat on the mat. 
So the important thing for victims of similarity disorder is that having lost the power to select from this pool of language, they rely on what is already present, the present context. They cannot start a dialogue, but they are able to complete or continue them after a fashion. Or they can come up with sentences that are at best the sequel of a previous utterance. So when you present a patient with scraps of words or sentences, the patient can really complete it. But his speech is merely reactive. He can carry on conversation, but would find it very hard to start a dialogue or start a conversation. Now, a person with contiguity disorder would find it really hard to combine linguistic elements. The grammar fails them. They can only express heaps of words. So the order of the words become chaotic and any word with purely grammatical functions like conjunctions, articles, they tend to drop out of the picture altogether. So sometimes you find their utterances are likely to become telegraphic as two or three words or infantile or childlike as in I hungry instead of saying I'm hungry. Sometimes they can manage only very short sentences. Thus Jacobson identified that those with aphasia would have a language deficiency that corresponds to one or two of these two axes, the paradigmatic axis, that's a vertical axis of selection, or the syntagmatic axis, which is the horizontal axis of combination. He also associated these two disorders with two figures of speech, metaphor and metonymy. Metaphor works on the basis of similarity, whereas metonymy works by contiguity or association between two concepts. So a patient with similarity disorder would find metaphoric operations difficult, whereas one with contiguity disorder would find metonymic operations equally difficult. This is the point where Jacobson conceptualized his theory of language. For him, metaphor and metonymy are two defining poles of language. All linguistic expression lies somewhere between these two extremes. They are rhetorical figures, which are figures of equivalence. They are used to substitute a term with a new term, which is its equivalent. Now let's take a look at metaphor. Here we are substituting a word with another through the process of selection and association. This is based on similarity principle and is a commonly used trope in poetry. Let's say I want to describe the traffic of the day. I can choose words like bustle, race, goes from this vertical axis of selection to describe the traffic. Somehow I found the traffic to be very slow and I have chosen the term crawl. By making a statement like the traffic crawls along, I am drawing an equivalence between the pattern of movement of the vehicles as well as that of insects. Obviously, Crawling has got nothing to do with vehicles, but I'm assuming a similarity between the two. I have selected crawl from this vertical axis and combined it with the term traffic. Thus, crawl becomes a metaphor for the vehicular movement. Now let's take a look at metonymy. This is where we substitute a term with another through the principle of combination. This is based on contiguity, where a word is placed next to another because of its association, where the part is substituted for the whole. Now, this is primarily used in prose. For example, in the statement, the orders were issued by Rashtrapati Bhavan. We know that the building, that's Rashtrapati Bhavan, does not issue orders. It's in fact the president of India who resides in the Rashtrapati Bhavan, who issues these orders. So here the building is taken to be an equivalent of his resident, the president of India by the principle of contiguity. That is the association drawn between Rashtrapati Bhavan and its resident. This language operates in two ways, through selection of words and combination of words. I hope the concepts were clear for you. Thank you for listening.